Okay, today what we want to go on to uh, is the next chapter in Chen called Diffusion and, Resist Diffusion and Resistivity. And for this, um, uh, so let me just label here first um, Diffusion and Resistivity. Um, I actually have a rather different way of presenting this than what Chen does, so I should sort of warn you of that. Uh, and his is, however, in uh, Chapter 5. Uh, but then in addition, uh, and I actually follow a little more uh, Bittencourt's description of this, at least the first part, and that's in Chapter 10. Uh, and, and this is sort of uh, plasma conductivity and diffusion, plasma electrical conductivity is what that means. So let's just put that in, electrical conductivity and diffusion. And then, uh, and chapter five is just this diffusion and resistivity is what Chen calls it. Now, the basic concept, let me just say, is we want to add collisions. We've been talking about a collision-less plasma, um, and what we want to do is add collisions. So basic concept and of this whole chapter, this whole set of talk, uh, concepts we're going to talk about. So add effects of collisions. Now, first com comment we ought to ask is uh, where are they going to come in in the descriptions that we've been using. And the descriptions that we have been using are, of course, density conservation and momentum conservation. So let me write down those conservation laws. So for density conservation, we had uh, dn dt plus del dot nv equals zero. And if I had collisions, what would it do? Well. If the collisions are number preserving, like they're just electron electron or ion ion collisions or something like that, and there's no annihilation processes, then I, w I still get zero because this is a density conservation equation. It says dNdt is something, right? But if I have ionization or recombination processes, then I will have some additional terms here. So let's call it some source and a typical source often will be an ionization source, which would be Ne, N0, sigma V. And usually this is written oh, in ionization. And most of the time, we're in a rather highly ionized plasma, uh, so we don't worry about this ionization source. And another comment is that since Coulomb collisions don't destroy any particles, Okay, they just maneuver them in velocity space or real space. Um, Coulomb collisions will actually get zero for Coulomb collisions. But if we have creation or destruction of charged particles, processes, then they will lead to uh, a non-zero source. Now, the other type uh, of the other uh, effect of collisions is, of course, then in our momentum balance, which was mn dv dt is equal to uh, nq e eh, plus v cross b. Uh, and then we had minus pressure gradient. And now, if we have collisions, uh, it will add plus something which is often called F, or let me, actually sometimes it's called R, so we'll just call it capital R here. And this is the, um, this is then the frictional force. Basically because of collisions of whatever species you're talking about in this momentum balance equation with all the other species. So it could be collisions between you know, ions and neutrals, or electrons and neutrals, or electrons and ions, or whatever. So, collisional or frictional force uh, due to collisions with other species. 
of particles. So now let's uh, kind of be a little more specific about the uh, particular uh, types of collisions. So the first one I want to consider then will actually be, let's just talk about electron collisions since that's uh, what we're often interested in. So electron collisions. In a plasma, what can electrons collide with? Well, a plasma is going to be made up of electrons, ions, say protons, and neutrals to some extent. We, if we have a fully ionized plasma, we won't have any neutrals, but we always have a few neutrals, you know. So we first have collisions on neutrals, and uh, this would be called electron, is usually called electron dash neutral collisions. And the rate, uh, so let me, electron neutral collisions, the rate that goes with this is then often written as, say, nu e, a collision frequency nu sub e, but a nu e naught, which means collisions of electrons on neutrals. And this will be, uh, and I'll sketch out here why in a moment, but it'll be sort of n naught uh, sigma v. And the way we'll sort of sketch that is imagine I have a whole bunch of neutrals sitting here, and I have an electron coming in. What is the rate at which that electron hits all of those neutrals? Well, the first thing to notice is that um, there's, a, there's a sort of volume here, or, or I'm sorry, any, any neutral in some sense has a cross section, which is roughly its, its size over which it can uh, interact. A neutral interaction distance, of course, is sort of the Bohr radius, you know, 10 to the minus 8 centimeters, something like that. And so each of these has a cross section sigma, uh, e each neutral. That, and an electron coming along may see that is the basic idea. Now, in the number of collisions per second, in per second, this particle, this electron, let's say, has a, a you know, is having a, an interaction distance of the order of the collision of the collision cross section sigma, and in some sense, if it's moving at velocity uh, v, then the volume. <coughs> of a tube, uh, a cylinder here, um, volume of cylinder traced out. Is uh, per unit time is, of course, n naught for the number of neutrals. Oh, I'm sorry, is sigma v. And then what you do is you multiply by n naught to get the number of, of neutrals you, that electron will hit per unit time. So uh, to get collision rate. And so that uh, equals n naught sigma v. Now, often people will put on an average on here. And what that means is that usually in a plasma, you've got a whole Maxwellian distribution function of electrons. So there's not one typical velocity. You know, you've got to integrate over the whole velocity distribution function of electrons. So that's what that average means. It means average over Maxwellian electron distribution. Uh, electron distribution function. Okay, so uh, now in round numbers, let me just say um, this number turns out to be on the order of something like 10 to the minus ninth um, centimeters cubed per second, and it turns out that's it, it, then most plasmas don't have very strong neutral effects as long as they're so-called burned out or more or less ionized. 
by the way, just to make sure the units here, the density is units of what? Well, it's number per meter cubed. We're trying to maintain our MKS units here. Sigma, cross-section, it's an area, so it's meters squared. Velocity, or speed, that's meters per second. So indeed, you know, all this cancels, and this becomes seconds to the minus 1. Should I write that as radians per second or cycles per second? Well, the answer is no, because this is a collision rate, okay? But it's not, it's not an oscillatory process, right? So radians per second or, or hertz or cycles per second is not a meaningful uh, quantity here. Okay, so this is collisions on neutrals. What else can, um, can happen to electrons? Well, they can hit on electrons. Okay. And for that, we would have, um, we would just call it electron-electron uh, collisions. And that's usually written as nu sub EE. E. But that process, notice by itself, surely is particle conserving. It doesn't create or destroy processes. Coulomb collisions between uh, two electrons. But also it turns out it doesn't destroy momentum because you have two electrons coming in and the same momentum going out is coming in. There's no exchange of momentum. There's no change in the overall momentum of the system. So these are our density, um, comma, momentum conserving. And then finally, we can have on ions, collisions of electrons on ions. Uh, and for that, uh, we call that again, or electron uh, ion collisions. And that's new EI. Are those particle conserving? Do they change the number of particles? Well, after the collision, I still have an electron and an ion, so it's particle conserving. I still have the same number of electrons after as before, same number of ions. But it's not momentum conserving because the electron in a Coulomb collision can exchange some uh, momentum with the electrons or with the ions. So this is only density, electron density, say, conserving. Now, often what people do, knowing that you have neutral collisions, electron collisions, and ion collisions, is they write an overall nu as the sum over nu e, you know, j, for collision with all other species. And that would then be, usually it's just nu ee e plus nu ei plus nu e naught. And so, you know, it's just some overall collision frequency because I can collide with uh, each of the other species. Um, okay, so let's uh, go a little further. Suppose I have a collision frequency, and uh, I'd like to know about a collisional mean-free path. Well, in you know, the question is, how far do I go before I collide? And the answer, of course, is that I'll move um, at the thermal velocity and in a time, 1 over the collision frequency. Uh, one, let's just leave it as 1 over nu. And we often just write this as, say, V thermal over nu because we have in mind a whole distribution of particles and hence with an average or typical uh, thermal velocity um, uh, v thermal. And then we'd have collisions. Uh, if we're talking about ions, they'd have one collision rate. Talking about electrons, they might have a different one, and so forth. Now, the next thing I need to introduce is something which in the business is usually called a dynamical friction force. Dynamical means that there's only friction if you're moving. And let's go back to our momentum conservation equation. 
What we said from the momentum conservation equation was we expected to see a frictional force here. What should be the units of that frictional force? Well, if you look back to the inertia force, mn dv dt, it's going to have, the frictional force is going to have to have units of mass times density times flow velocity times some rate. So the rate I'd obviously choose is the collision frequencies that I've just uh, talked about. And the flow velocity I choose would be the flow velocity of that species. But if the species that I'm interacting with or colliding with is also moving, then the friction is friction to that different reference frame of that other species. So just with that physical uh, thinking, you can say that the dynamical friction force, which I guess I called R, so we'll leave it as R, is equal to then minus m n nu times the flow velocity minus flow velocity, uh, let me call it reference frame, or, or uh, actually what it is is uh, uh, other species. Uh, other species being collided with. Or it's, it's equilibrium frame or whatever. Now, many times what we do is we have in mind that we're considering, say, an electron distribution function, whole, you know, sea of electrons, and they're hitting a bunch of ions. And ions are slow-moving guys, you know, at the same time. Uh, thermal velocity, uh, same temperature. So often what we do is we say, well, we'll go to the ion rest frame. Okay, if the ions have a flow velocity, we'll go to, over to whatever rest frame that is, and then we'll just set this equal to zero, and we'll have that the friction force is just minus mn nu v. Okay, now we can, so this is just uh, phenomenological, but it's also what comes out of doing a, a real bang-up job on... Uh, uh, on kinetic theory, which is how you have to actually derive these things. Now, the next thing I want to do then is explore what the effects of this dynamical friction force would be uh, in a plasma. So to do that, what, what we do is we write down what's called the Langevin equation, which is in fact just the uh, momentum balance equation with this particular um, uh, frictional force. And I'm going to do it only for electrons. And what the Langevin equation really means is that, um, is that I'm choosing a particular dynamical friction term. But anyway, so this is me ne dve by dt is equal to, and then the Lorentz force density, ne qe e plus v cross b. And that's got to be the electron flow velocity and minus grad PE, and then minus ME, NE, nu E, VE. And we're going to sort of neglect these for a moment here. And this last term uh, is, of course, just what we've been talking about. That's our dynamical friction force. Oh, by the way, why is it called a dynamical friction? You've got to be moving to you know, to have a, a friction, but it's actually more derived from the fact that when you do uh, kinetic theory, um, you, um, you have to have particles in motion to calculate it. So anyway, uh, so neglecting the Lorentz force and the pressure gradient uh, force, then this equation becomes simply dVe by dt is equal to minus nu e times Ve. Now, remember that VE, okay, was the average flow velocity of the distribution function. So it's integral dQ VV distribution function and divided by, say, integral dQ VF, which would be the density, okay? So this is NV over NV over N. Um, and so this equation doesn't say that all the individual particles, okay, are going to suffer a frictional drag. Rather, it says that the average flow velocity of the electron distribution function is. So, you know, you've got all kinds of thermal spreads, but the whole distribution function on average is going to slow down. 
And you can easily uh, solve this equation, okay? It's sort of the flow velocity is equal to the flow velocity at initially times, you know, like e to the minus t over, uh, well, I should say e to the minus nu sub e t. And that's, of course, going to go to zero for times long compared to 1 over nu e, which we will often call tau e for the collision time. Okay? So what collisions do then is they tend to relax or to zero the flow velocity of any given species, like the electrons. But really, to zero means to the same flow velocity as the other species, whatever they're colliding with. And that's easy if you only have, say, an electron ion plasma. That means they both try to flow at the same velocity, unless you have additional forces that cause it not to happen, which we will. The electric field will induce a flow velocity and a current, hence an electrical resistivity in a little bit. But barring that, uh, you try to re the Coulomb collisions try to cause all species to flow with the same velocity. Um, the only problem with that a little bit is that suppose I have a three-species plasma. I have electrons, protons, and when I make a real plasma, I have a little bit of trouble with pump oil and a few things like that. So I get a little bit of carbon or something. So I get electrons, protons, and carbon nuclei. Okay. Now what's the common flow velocity? Well, it turns out the ions all equilibrate pretty well, and then the electrons slowly come into equilibrium. But that's some of the details one has to get into if one really goes into Coulomb collision processes. Okay, now, um, so, so obviously, you, you know, for relaxation of flows to equilibrium, or frankly, for determining uh, the Ohm's law, uh, hence the electrical conductivity of a plasma, and so forth and so on, we better get a handle on what exactly this collision frequency is. So the next thing I want to talk about then is a sort of uh, very rough or crude estimation of, of uh, Coulomb collisions, and it's called uh, the Lorentz model. So let's uh, talk about that, and I'll try to tell you what the Lorentz model is. So this is um, Coulomb collisions in a Lorentz collision model. Um, and first I should tell you that uh, this is in Chen 5.6.2 and also in Bittencourt in somewhat greater detail and more some of the details in chapter 20. Okay, first we ought to say, what's the Lorentz model? Well, I keep saying these electrons are hot-footed guys running around real fast, you know, and we got sort of slow-footed uh, ions nearly immobile. So the Lorentz model basically says, let's, let's formalize that into a set of approximations. And the approximation is that you have immovable ions, or immo immovable, or I'll later say immobile uh, ions. Also, implicitly, it turns out you take the approximation that the ion charge is much greater than one uh, to basically neglect uh, electron, electron. I just abbreviated as E dash E uh, collisions. So the idea is you imagine that there is an ion sitting here with charge plus uh, ZIE, and uh, we have a, an electron coming by, okay, and uh, it's coming back by with some, it turns out, some impact parameter B, but we won't really worry about that. And actually, as it goes by, so here's the electron, and it's got charge minus E. Uh, it's going to get attracted a little bit, and so it'll deviate in its orbit. So this is the electron. Um, because of the, the electric field of the ion. So 
Basically, what we want to do to calculate the Coulomb collision is a, a cross-section, let's say, is we'd like to get some feel for how big is this interaction distance B, or a typical interaction distance, uh, to get some form of a collision. So to do that, the first thing we need to do is ask the question, well, suppose that I'm a distance um, R. Uh, let me draw, let's see. Suppose I'm a distance R away uh, from the electron from the ion and any instantaneous point along the orbit. Um, what is the Coulomb potential from the ion at the position of the electron? So Coulomb potential uh, of the ion at the electron position. Well, the potential is just the charge divided by the distance, uh, but because we're in MKS units, it's going to be the, uh, well, and it's the ion charge, and because we're in MKS units, there's this nice little normalizing factor of 4 pi epsilon naught. If, of course, you're in CGS units, there's no 4 pi epsilon naught to worry about, and that's one of the reasons why theoreticians in plasma physics all like CGS units. There's no 4 pi epsilon to worry about, you see, and then an R for the distance of separation of the two. So with that being the case, what is the force on the electron because of the presence of the ion? Okay. So force on the electron due to ion. And of course, the force is going to be Q sub E times the electric field. And the electric field Okay, is going to be minus grad phi for this potential. Okay, so if we uh, figure that out, that's going to be the force is going to be uh, q sub e times uh, or minus q sub e grad phi, and that's equal to minus, <coughs> and then the charge on the electron is minus e, and the gradient, okay, is uh, of phi is going to be the ion charge, and maybe I should have said the ion charge is, of course, zi times the electron ch charge E. So this is minus, minus, um, and then finally, uh, there's the gradient, and I'm not going to worry about the sign of all this. It's going to turn, going to turn out. So the gradient is then minus uh, zi E over 4 pi epsilon naught times R squared. So uh, if we uh, stick all this together, this becomes, oh, and it's in the r hat direction, which is just the direction between the two. You'd have to figure out which direction, you know, detail forces from plus to minus, of course. So effectively, it's that way, or sorry, that way, anyway, or on the electron it pulls. Anyway, uh, so the idea then is that this will be uh, z sub i e squared divided by 4 pi uh, epsilon naught uh, times r squared times r hat. Now, the question we'd like to ask is, as the electron passes here, okay, how, how much of an impulse uh, force change in m delta v do we get because of the fact that... Um, uh, that we, you know, we went past this uh, this ion. So, uh, for how long? So, to, to answer that, you know, an impulse would be m delta v or delta m v, and that would be force times delta t, some time. So, what we need then um, is that we need the interaction time. So, let's say the electron. This is just an estimation procedure, by the way. Will uh, experience the force for a time delta t of the order of, well, you know, it's sort of r uh, divided by the velocity. So 
it'll just be sort of r divided by the velocity. Now, this yields, this is causes then a momentum change. of delta mv, which is then the force that we experience times the delta t, and uh, putting back our, our force here now, not worrying about signs, this becomes then zi e squared over 4 pi uh, epsilon naught, r over v, so we'll just get rv. Now, what we would like to calculate is that, you, you know, if we were going to have a momentum relaxation process, remember we were sort of flow velocity, a momentum relaxation, a frictional force. You know, what we'd like to do is estimate not just the frictional force, not just the momentum transfer, but we need to do it for those cases where we really change the momentum, like, say, 90 degrees or something like that. So what we do is say for 90 degree collisions, of order 90 degree collisions, we would expect, uh, we expect, or you know, for those collisions we would have, um, delta mv of order mv. That being the case, and, and then, so that's then of order Okay, zi e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r v. That being the case, now I can solve for the typical interaction distance. So r, which is of order b typical, let me call it that way, impact parameter, which is then going to be of order uh, zi e squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught times uh, m v squared. So what this then tells me is for a 90 degree collision, you know, so for a 90 degree collision, okay, what I have is that this electron comes along and he does this, okay, so this is 90 degree collision. And what I've just calculated is for such a 90 degree collision, the typical impact parameter, you know, the distance of closest approach, you know, wherever the interaction takes place, is given by this formula here. So how would I then calculate the cross-section? Well, it's sort of I'm coming along and how big is the interaction distance? So the cross-section the cross -section would then be pi times b if typical. Okay? So that would be like pi uh, zi squared e to the fourth power 4 pi epsilon naught squared um, and then uh, m squared v to the fourth. Um, now with that uh, then the next thing we want to do is to say what would the collision uh, frequency be. Okay. So, uh, because that was what we were trying to calculate, collision frequency of electrons. And the collision frequency then uh, uh, would again be n sigma v. And so that would be n sigma, I've just calculated or estimated this formula, uh, pi zi squared e to the fourth power uh, divided by 4 pi epsilon naught squared. And see, I wouldn't need that 4 pi epsilon naught if I was dealing CGS, so that's the reason why people sometimes don't like it. v to the fourth and times v. This v cancels one of those, and so ultimately what we get is pi zi squared, that's the charge on the ion squared, e to the fourth divided by uh, 4 pi epsilon naught squared mv cubed. So that's our estimate of the um, 
Coulomb collision frequency, frequency of Coulomb collisions of an electron moving through a sea of immobile ions. Now, uh, if you do a real fancy kinetic theory calculation, um, so let me say kinetic theory, and that's what uh, one does in course number 725, what you find is that um, this isn't quite the right answer. Namely, there becomes a 4 there. And also, there becomes an additional factor, which is called log lambda in the business. Now, physically, what that log lambda is, is if we go back and look at our Coulomb collision model here, okay, I said we were interested in a 90-degree collision. But a 90-degree collision is a kind of close, hard collision. Okay? And there's a lot more longer-range collisions. Okay, I mean, you know, within a Debye length, okay, uh, the Coulomb potential of an ion will be seen by all electrons. So all electrons within a Debye length will see all the ions, you know, within that Debye length. So what it turns out is that this log lambda is a factor that takes account of what's called cumulative uh, small angle collisions which on the total add up to effective 90 degree collisions. So small angle or, you know, uh, collisions. And for that, this factor log lambda turns out to be the logarithm of the maximum interaction distance over the minimum interaction distance. And as I just said, the maximum interaction distance turns out to be the Debye length, okay? Because remember, outside of a Debye length, particles uh, get Debye shielded, and so one particle doesn't feel the, the Coulomb force of the other one. It gets Debye shielded away. And what's the shortest interaction distance? Well, it's basically, it's the, it's the B typical, which I just talked about. It's the B 90 degree collisions, it turns out, or 180. They're almost the same, it turns out. Now, uh, how big is this? Well, it turns out that this is approximately equal to <clears throat> the logarithm of 4 pi n lambda to pi cubed, if you work it all out. That's kind of an interesting number. The reason it's an interesting number is it's the logarithm of the number of particles in a Debye cubed uh, times 3. So we just call it the number of particles in a Debye cubed. And uh, remember, that was a number we had to have large for the number of four for having a plasma. We had to have that we didn't have two particles just interacting one with another solely with Coulomb potential interactions, but we had to have lots of particles interacting with each other. Okay? So this turns out to be much greater than one. A typical number might be, say, 10 to the seventh, and then it turns out this logarithm is about 17. And so a canonical number, which people use in the absence of calculating it, is typically 17. And since it's a logarithm, you know, the stuff inside doesn't matter uh, too much, let's say. It's not too sensitively uh, dependent upon that. Okay, now let's uh, think about this Coulomb collision frequency a little bit more. Um, notice that... Um, well, I guess I'll just write it down here. Um, so let's say Coulomb collision frequency. And this is four electrons. Again, uh, in the Lorentz collision model, which is just lightweight electrons running around colliding with um, um, immobile heavy ions. And what we have found is that actually it's nu EI, we sometimes label it, we either label it nu, and it's a function all of how fast this particle is moving, and so it's nu EI of V. And it's written then as 4 pi ion density 
zi squared e to the fourth power, all divided by uh, 4 pi epsilon naught squared, m sub e um, squared v cubed, and this factor of log lambda. Now, one of the interesting things about this formula, or this collision rate, um, collision frequency, is that notice that it goes proportional to 1 over v cubed. So that says low-speed electrons suffer a lot of collisions, but high-speed electrons are moving too fast, and so they don't have very many uh, collisions. And the other thing is that this, this collision frequency is kind of a, an important collision frequency. It's sort of uh, more or less the basic Coulomb collision frequency. You, 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 there's a number of other collisional processes, but this is sort of the basic one, and then everything else gets referenced uh, to this basic Coulomb collision frequency. Now, this was for a single electron hitting a whole bunch of ions that are immobile. But the thing we might be a little more interested in is what about uh, a whole Maxwellian distribution function of electrons, which is, however, maybe flowing with respect to the ions. So to get that, uh, what we would like to know is the, the Maxwellian um, uh, so a, a Maxwellian average uh, electron Coulomb collision frequency. And that is we, what we would do is we would calculate the integral dQ v of the distribution function, and then we'd write down minus m n nu of v times v. And this will turn out to be, by definition, minus the collisional friction force, minus m e n e nu e times the electron flow velocity. And so the distribution function here actually has to be a, a flowing Maxwellian. Uh, if you do that, what you find is that nu sub e uh, which many people then call a, a sort of fundamental average collision time, 1 over tau sub e, is equal to a nice little number of 4 over 3 root pi, which is not too different from unity, but it's always nice to have these nice special-looking factors that make you convince the people that you've done a little work, you know. Uh, anyway, of this collision frequency we had here, but measured at the electron thermal speed. So instead of an arbitrary speed v, uh, this means evaluated with that electron thermal speed. Now, um, this formula turns out to be a little bit ugly to evaluate, you know, e to the fourth mass squared v cubed, 4 pi epsilon naught, you know, it's uh, quite a lot of things. So one always has, you know, the old handy-dandy formulas and my particular one is it's 66 microseconds times the temperature, electron temperature in KeV to the 3 halves power. By the way, why to the 3 halves power? Well, 1 over V cubed, the V goes proportional to root T, and so there's your 3 halves power right there. And then divided by... Uh, zi times n sub e divided by 10 to the 19th per meter cubed. Well, meter cubed that way. And what this is trying to emphasize is that if you have a sort of semi-typical laboratory plasma uh, with one kilovolt electron temperature, maybe a little on the high side, uh, and a density of about 10 to the 19th per cubic meter or 10 to the 13th per cubic centimeter, then your electron collision time is going to be about 66 microseconds. 
So this is a very fundamental Coulomb collision frequency, and it'll turn out in a moment. We'll discuss how it uh, gives us the plasma electrical um, conductivity. Uh, but before we do that, I want to make uh, one other observation on the magnitude of the Coulomb collision frequency. So magnitude of Coulomb collision frequency. And here, uh, what I want to do is compare it to some other frequency in the plasma that's more typical. Remember, we had plasma oscillations. Well, maybe we could compare it to the plasma frequency. So let's uh, look back to our formula here. And first, let's remember that nu sub e is this formula. Well, it's 4 over 3 root pi. But for this estimation process, this is going to be of order unity, so we'll neglect it. And then the rest of this is then 4 pi ni zi squared e to the fourth log lambda, all divided by 4 pi epsilon naught, um, quantity squared, electron mass squared, and the electron thermal speed uh, squared. Um, Anybody recognize anything in there? Well, you remember nq squared over mass times epsilon naught was the plasma frequency. And I said I'd like to kind of refer this to the plasma frequency. So let's just remember that omega p squared is nq squared over m epsilon naught. And I won't worry about the z sub i. I'll take this equal to 1 for simplicity. And... Uh, just because we're kind of scaling things here. And my 4 pi's, I'll just get a 1 over 4 pi in the denominator. And then, you know, I've got an n, I need an n q squared over m epsilon naught. I got an m squared and an epsilon naught squared downstairs, denominator. But I only got one n upstairs, so I'll put an n out here, n i. And then we'll have an n e squared over m e epsilon naught quantity squared. So that took care of the mass. Uh, and then we have a 1 over V thermal electron cubed and our friendly little log lambda factor. Now this is the electron plasma frequency to the fourth power. Okay? Because omega p squared is N e squared over m epsilon naught. But let's also remember that the electron to by length was approximately equal to, within a root 2 factor, V thermal E divided by omega PE. So with that being the case, and we won't worry about the ion density, whether it's the ion or electron density, we'll assume we're dealing with protons, for instance. And so this becomes 1 over 4 pi N lambda to by. There's a V thermal squared put it together with three powers of omega p, and we get a lambda to by cubed with e, but anyway. And I'm left over with one power of the plasma frequency, omega p. And then I have log lambda. But remember I discussed a moment ago that log lambda can be written as 4 pi n lambda to by cubed. So what this tells us then is that for a plasma, for which we are fully ionized collective interaction plasma, for which we are supposed to have n lambda to by cubed is a big number. Okay, uh, This is surely going to be much less than the plasma frequency for n lambda to by cubed, much greater than 1. So this is the reason why um, often people talk about more or less collisionless plasmas. Because if I have a plasma, then the, cou the Coulomb collision processes are sort of just, you know, when you work them out, they're guaranteed to be small compared to the intrinsic fastest oscillation in the plasma, the plasma frequency. However, we'll later get to some lower frequency oscillations, uh, more fluid-like things, more magnetohydrodynamic sound waves, things like that. And then 
Um, it turns out the collisions can compete with that. But, but the typical plasma oscillations, something oscillating at the plasma frequency, Coulomb collisions are, in fact, uh, very weak. So we'll stop there for a minute and uh, come back.